Scholarship. Everyone's talking scholarship. So let's have a chat about scholarship. It's time for another show from Colin Jones, the reasonable adventurer. Time for you to take another step towards creating your own opportunities for satisfaction. And it is a huge welcome to you all to episode 109. I'm really excited today to be working through some ideas, revisiting some ideas, I suppose, uh, that I laid out in one of the chapters of my book, How to Teach Entrepreneurship. But don't panic, they're just as relevant to any other area of teaching as they would be to entrepreneurship. They're ideas that build a lot on this notion of assessing scholarship. And so I'm really adapting and sort of borrowing some of the ideas that uh, Glassic, Huber and Miroff had in their book, Scholarship Assessed, which is a fantastic read. Uh, and I, I suppose, contextualise those back into well, clearly something that was relevant for entrepreneurship education, but I think just brought, try to bring a bit of a contemporary feel to it um, in terms of my own way of thinking, which hopefully will be of some value to you as we go along. I think the key thing I wanted to talk about in terms of scholarship, it's something that just keeps popping up into a whole range of different conversations I'm having at work. People come at it from slightly different angles, but I think a lot of those angles intersect at this issue of how do we know if it's actually happening? How do we know we're engaged in scholarship of teaching and learning and so I wanted to offer you a scoreboard that can actually help you to know you are it's not necessarily a scoreboard that you're going to add up so I'm going to talk about that as we go through and I think that's one of the challenges that we all face here to start with, though, I wanted to share with you this quote. I've done it in several shows before, but it always just seems so relevant um, from Hoffa. Uh, and there's this notion of this unfinishedness, and you'll hopefully see the relevance of this in a minute. Nature attains perfection, but man never does. There is a perfect ant, a perfect bee, but man is perpetually finished, sorry, unfinished. He is both an unfinished animal and an unfinished man. It is this incurable unfinishedness which sets man apart from other living things. For an attempt to finish himself, man becomes a creator. Moreover, the incurable unfinishedness keeps man perpetually immature, perpetually capable of learning and growing. And it's this notion of unfinishedness that I believe is so important and central to how we assess our scholarship of teaching and learning. Teaching is a long game where the scoreboard is rarely ever tallied up. There are moments when we are applying for a teaching grant or every semester we might evaluate our teaching and learning and we get a student evaluation scores coming or some other metric and we say we're going to evaluate your teaching practice, or some aspect of your scholarship. It's a tough thing to do. It's a tough thing to do. And to be honest with you, it's this aspect of unfinishedness. How long have you been teaching for? Five years, 10 years, 15, 20, longer? So what were you doing last year that's different than today? What were you doing 10 years that's different than today? How do you score that, right? How do you actually create a score? It's not like we have a trophy at the end of every period of teaching and we decide whether you win or you lose. It's this process that's continually moving. So it's not an easy thing to do, right? Because we could easily dine out vicariously on a few outliers. We could say, look, look at this amazing student who has done these things during my time as a teacher. We can all do that, right? Just like we can look back historically and say, that person was my student 10 years ago. Look what they're doing now. That's a pretty poor way to try and create any metrics or sense of your scholarly practice. And as we'll talk, scholarly practice and scholarship of teaching and learning are separate things. Interrelated, yes, but separate things. 
So I want to propose a scholarship scoreboard where your humility, your passion, and your curiosity all count. It's a very qualitative scoreboard, okay? And I want you to think about the cohort, not the individual outliers, as you go through this process. So let's not cherry pick really unique and outlying data that paints us in a fantastic way. Let's just look at things as they are. And if things aren't great in some aspect of our practice, that's good, right? That creates opportunities for introspection, opportunities for us to revisit the nature of that practice. That brings in all the ingredients of a scholarship. So (laughs) Glassic and his team, they had several, uh, they had six categories, um, and I've renamed them in my approach, not because I'm trying to pretend that I didn't rely on their work, it's in my book, it's very clearly uh, identified that I've been working with their ideas. I've tried to bring a more contemporary sense to it so I can marry it back to other areas of focus that I think are good scholarly practice. I start with thinking about our purpose. A classic calls that clear goals. Are there clear goals? I talk about a purpose. So what is the aim? What is the aim of your teaching? Are there boundaries that exist around your teaching? And are they known to all? Can you create a context for your innovative behaviours? Because that's so important, right? If people don't understand what you're attempting to do, and they don't understand the boundaries that sort of create the context within which you're engaging in your practice, when you're doing something that just seems a little bit out of the normal, it's not surprising that sometimes people will push back and say, that looks like it's inappropriate. We're not supportive of that approach. So by creating that sense that you know what's appropriate for your context and here are the boundaries and within these boundaries I'm attempting these goals this is really really important and in a sense if we think about it in terms of pedagogical content knowledge and I'll talk more about that in a minute that's formed and informed through how you define your purpose so being able to clearly identify outline what your purpose is to all stakeholders is critically important. It's the central starting point of your scholarship of teaching and learning. The next area is domain knowledge. We all operate in different domains. Classic calls this adequate preparation. I'm calling it domain knowledge. So from where is your processes your context informed. What is it about your specific area that makes it unique, that means that you're doing something that's going to be different to other people? Your scholarship is going to be different. Is it regionally influenced or is it something more global? Are you you relying on transformative learning or is it some other type of process that you're trying to achieve? Is it influenced by your personal experiences Or is it influenced by your understanding of other people's personal experiences? Now here I find it quite useful um, to to look at this notion of of pedagogical content knowledge. I've gone beyond that. I'm not going to address that here um, because I think it'll only complicate issues when we don't need to. Um, But I think that uh, Magnuson's great uh, article uh, on pedagogical content knowledge uh, I think that is a cracking read for, for everybody. Um, and that just gives you this lovely outline of those domains of knowledge in which you need to know things. You need to know the knowledge of your content area. You need to know knowledge of how students in that area operate. What are the types of areas of difficulty they have? What are the requirements for their learning? 
you need to have knowledge of the instructional strategies you're going to use in that space that may be unique to that area. You need to have knowledge of the assessment practices. And in my work uh, in entrepreneurship, I argue that we need to have an understanding of transformative learning processes and that they would influence all of those other four areas. But importantly, Magnuson discusses how all of those domains of knowledge are influenced by our own orientation, right? And it's not necessarily just the teaching philosophy we may hold, but our orientation to life. We are individual people with different experiences, different aspirations, different contexts, and our life context comes into all of that. So we've started so far by thinking about what is it you're trying to do and what's the context, the domain you're operating in and what knowledge would be required for you to be able to successfully operate in that space. We can then move on to think about this notion of practice. Classic calls this appropriate methods. So what practices are appropriate in your domain? In my world of entrepreneurship education, hudagogy is very appropriate because we really want the student to bring along their own aspirations, their own motivations, and we want them to personalise that learning journey very early in the piece so we can work out how can we support them, okay? But in other areas, that may be less important, perhaps in law. Perhaps we don't want every individual student to go off on a highly personalised learning journey. Maybe we really have some fundamental things that we really need to get embedded from the word go so that that journey can be more successful for them. So there's an importance here in in trying to understand the place of signature pedagogies. What is it about your particular area that's influenced by specific things? Maybe we're going to see different practice occurring in engineering than we are in nursing, than we are in architecture, than we are in, in accounting. And that's fine, right? We need to respect those contexts. But how can you evidence the effectiveness of your practice in your context? And perhaps what choices for your students are present within your approach? We have increasingly diverse cohorts of students that we're working with. So how can you enable your practice to have that inbuilt flexibility into it so that students can still have those great outcomes. So that's the, uh, that's the fourth area we're going to focus on now, is outcomes. Uh, Glassic calls these significant results. Remember, scholarly teaching is not the same as a scholarship of teaching. Scholarly teaching can be quite unsuccessful whilst at the same time your scholarship of teaching and learning can be quite successful, right? And vice versa, right? One of the challenges here is is that the evidence is not always clear-cut. It's not always easy to know whether or not you're teaching well, right? I've had the last few years of pretty poor teaching evaluations. If you look at the overall, you know, aggregate uh, assessment of the students, luckily one of my colleagues was able to show me that if I dug into that a little bit deeper, I could actually see it was quite bimodal, where we actually had a couple of cohorts of students who really liked the teaching uh, and learning experience, and a couple of cohorts who were really not liking it at all, and in between people who most probably uh, weren't as severe one way or the other. But Sodal can help us to reduce ambiguity by contextualizing your practice and the outcomes associated with it. And this is really, really important for us in being able to have a buffer between when teaching is hard and when it's not working as well as we would like it to, to be, when we're really struggling to make that connection with our students. SODL can actually help us to work through that process. So you need to stay focused on who the outcomes matter the most for. In my case, it's always been the students. I'm not teaching 
for the benefit of the university, I'm teaching for the benefit of the students. And if I succeed in that task, the institution will always win, right? So, it sort of brings us to this notion of uh, external valu valu valuation. And I think that's um, a tough area for us all because there's a lot of blockages. Uh, Classic calls this effective presentation of your scholarship. I think just validation is fine. Um, one of the challenges here is being able to look beyond the journals. Lots of journals out there, and it's great, uh, you know, and I participate and I look for everyone, encourage everyone to sort of be in that space, right? But being really innovative and doing different things and working through really tough times doesn't necessarily mean that journals are going to open their arms to you and say, yes, we, we really want the world to know that. It's very easy to get blocked in that process. So we we sort of have blogs, online blogs, podcasts, videos, etc., all sorts of different medium now where we can actually use those things to present our practice and our results for external review. So there's some courage that's needed here, right? We can look to create conversations. But the key here really is to look to avoid trying to convince the world that you are right. I was having a conversation last night with a colleague, uh, Gustav, in Sweden, and chatting through a paper that we're getting towards the end of uh, producing. And he read me a little quote, uh, which was really cool, because it really relates to this challenge here. And I'll just read that quote for you. A person's constructions are true to that person, but not necessarily to anyone else, since people produce knowledge based on their beliefs and experiences in situations. And that's by Schunk in 2012 from his book, Learning Theories and Educational Perspective. That's so true. I think one of the biggest challenges we have is that people, in their attempt to engage in their scholarship of teaching and learning, want to use this process of validation to convince the world that they're right, rather than offering their work for other people to provide commentary on, to provide feedback on, to provide support for, and to question. So we need to use language that encourages conversations not creates arguments. We're not looking to be right or wrong. We're really just looking to share that so that we might increase. And that sort of flows into this last area, which is what Glassic calls a reflective critique, but I call being an honest witness. And you might remember I've shared this quote on the show before. It's one that I truly like from uh, Robert McIver. Um, he, was, he always thought that he would never write a an autobiography, because he thought that people never tell the truth. He wrote, In the courts they swear, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. They never do, they never can. But without an honest witness, the story would never be told. And without your ability to develop that reflective and introspective capacity, your story will never be told either. The challenge is be accepting that you can never really remove your inner voice from your subtle, but you can balance it out by introducing your appreciation for others' voices. So, ask yourself, how is your inner voice, and therefore your practice, being influenced by those other voices? That's a really, really good place for you to start. I could easily say I've come up with these six areas, but my understanding and my desire to create a scoreboard for scholarship of teaching and learning isn't something that I just came up with. I've looked at Glassic's, Huber and Mayoff's work. I really like it. It aligns nicely with the way that I view the world and I've created my own little other metrics that sit alongside it. In doing so, I think there's three lessons that we can take from this process. Your subtle is, one, a manifestation of your selfhood. 
as Palmer would call it. It's part of your identity. If you're not able to come to grips with your identity as an educator, it's going to be really difficult for you to develop a really good subtle practice. Subtle is something that forms over time. So don't rush it. You don't need to add the scoreboard up every every semester, every year. You don't need to try and peg yourself. It's not like um, you know, your Google Scholar Index or something like that where you might be looking at it and comparing yourself to other people or whatever the case may be. It's not that type of a scoreboard. And three, subtle is born from the courage it takes to share your practice, your thinking and your students' outcomes that are occurring under your watch. If you don't have the courage and the honesty to be able to share those without being worried about what people may say, it's going to be very hard for this scholarship of teaching and learning practice to go. Now, I'm going to run you through what, for me, that scoreboard looks like. And it's important to remember here as I go through this list that we're not talking about an opportunity to add up these indicators and create a scoreboard in terms of a number. These are just indicators that you can tick off. If you can tick them off, then you're doing just fine. You don't need to compare your scholarship of teaching and learning to anyone else's. You just need to know that you've got the right practices happening. So let's start from the top. Your purpose. Your purpose vis-a-vis your students' learning outcomes are clearly stated, yes or no. And that's to all stakeholders. Your stated purpose is realistic and achievable, yes or no. Your stated purpose is aligned to institutional and school objectives, yes or no. Stakeholder trust has been developed around your stated purpose, yes or no. Now hopefully what you can see across this is the way I've created this scoreboard is that I'm saying, one, you know what you're doing and other people know what you're doing. Two, as Bloom would say, can these things actually be achieved? Three, they fit the role that you're trying to play within your institution And four, everyone has got around you and they all agree. So you can just have one tick there. You can say, well, I've told everyone what I'm going to do. They may not agree. Okay, so you've got one out of the four ticks. But if you can get clearly stated outcomes, if they're possible to achieve, if they align to the school's objectives, and if everyone else trusts you and wants to work with you, then your scholarship of teaching and learning in terms of your purpose is looking good. So let's move on to the main knowledge. You demonstrate command of broad, context-specific knowledge. Yes or no. Your pedagogical content knowledge is well-developed. That is, you know the subject area, you know the nature of appropriate assessment, you know how students engage in this space, you know the nature of the instructional strategies that would be most appropriate for that area, yes or no. Your selfhood is reconcilable to your to your application of domain knowledge. So your identity is a part of this. It's something that you accept and you can connect your life experience your aspirations, you can connect that to why and how you teach and the, and the knowledges that you preferences and maybe the knowledges you don't. And you've publicly shared your domain knowledge with your peers. So we've gone from purpose to you, what you know and how you organise it and how you justify it. Practice. Your chosen practice is understood and accepted by your peers. Many of us do things that are pretty weird, it would seem, from the outside. <clears throat> but if people understand our purpose and they appreciate the depth of domain knowledge we hold, then weird and wonderful practices can be well and truly accepted by our peers because they actually understand the context within which we're operating. So yes or no. You have evidenced 
your effective use of practice. So now we've got some data coming through here which is actually showing that this particular practice is effective in achieving the purpose, those learning outcomes that we were trying to achieve, yes or no. Your practice incorporates sufficient choice to support student diversity. So the approach that we've got isn't one size fits all. You've been able to create an approach to your teaching and learning that enables different types of students to coexist and achieve the same outcomes. Yes or no? Your practice has evolved with your developing subtle. So if we look at what you're doing against your historical practice, we can see shifts, we can see changes, and we can see how they've been informed by your reflection, but by your willingness to allow scrutiny of your practice and your outcomes by others. So now we can move on to those outcomes. Desired outcomes are clearly stated and understood by peers, yes or no. Outcomes are measured at the cohort level, yes or no. Now, I have a big bias here. I don't mind admitting that. I'm not interested in people putting up a poster about the outlying student. <laughs> it really makes my blood boil when I see somebody telling me that their teaching is brilliant because look at that one student who who went on to become whatever. Outcomes are measured at the cohort level. Yes or no? Clear links between your SODL and development of assessment methods. Yes or no? Your impact on student learning is externally validated. Yes or no? So, it may well be, and you should be able to see across these four these questions that I have in each one of these categories here, that they're sequential. You can start with desired outcomes are clearly stated and understood by peers. That may be where you're at. The next thing to add to that is that the outcomes are measured at the cohort level, that there's clear links between your SODL and the development of assessment methods, and finally, that your impact on student learning is externally validated. So for validation, your students materially benefit from the interaction with your practice. Yes or no. Your practice and or outcomes are shared with peers regularly. Yes or no. Your practice and or your subtle influences the practice of peers. Yes or no. The questions that arise from your practice are of interest to your peers. Yes or no? You can evidence your influence on your domain's developing SOTL. Yes or no? So this is a quite a tough area, the validation side of things, and so it should be because we're not talking about your teaching practice here, your scholarly practice. We're talking about that evolution of your SOTL. So as you come through and these repeated processes of refining your purpose, your domain knowledge, your practice and achieving these outcomes over and over again, and then being able to share that over time, whether that's five years or 10 years, over time, you become capable of being able to influence what's happening in your domain locally and beyond because of your willingness to share and have your outcomes and your practice be validated by your peers. And finally, honest witness. You can evidence many other voices in the development of your subtle. Yes or no? That is, you didn't write an article where you said you have solved all the world's problems. You alone have conquered this challenge. You've bought into the ideas of all of those past wonderful people, you know, whether it's Parker, whether it's Dewey, whether it's whoever it may be, all of those past wonderful thinkers, those voices are present in your approach. You can evidence how other voices have shaped your developing subtle. Yes or no? 
There is always evidence of your vulnerability present in your soul talk. You're not sure. You're willing to ask for help. You are willing to allow other people to critique your thoughts. Yes or no? And an autobiographical you is easily assessed by your peers. Yes or no? So when we put those together, purpose, domain knowledge, practice, outcomes, validation, and honest witness, we've got an area where we've got roughly, if I was to add them up, that one's got five, four. So there's 25 focus areas or indicators there. And you can put a tick next to the ones where you have and you can move on where you don't have a tick to think about how you're going to address that. It's purely qualitative. You don't have to score yourself out of 25. You can just look at the extent to which you've completed each one of those blocks where those questions are being addressed, where you can say yes. You don't have to say it's a big yes or it's a little yes. It's just yes. And that's it. Okay? So I hope that has been useful for you today in thinking about scholarship of teaching learning. It doesn't have to be this unbelievably um, rigorous process that you have to dedicate an entire different slot of your allocated time to, like an entirely different research project that you've got to try and find some time for. It's just something you can build into every day. You can choose how you share the outcomes that are emerging in your teaching practice. You can start just by doing that with the people that you work with and asking for their thoughts, their ideas. You can start by letting people know what your teaching learning outcomes are intended to be. You can put them on your door of your office. You, <laughs> there's so many different ways you can start this process of becoming vulnerable to other people and sharing the nature of that outcome. But most of important, most important, you can share all of this with your students. All of it. You can create an abridged teaching philosophy that's one paragraph. I've always carried that one paragraph around with me. It's always on the first couple of slides when I meet students and I say, this is why I'm here. This is what I'm about and this is how I'm going to try and help you. So do you do that? Is that where you start this process? Do you make sure students actually know who you are and what you're about and what you're trying to do to help them? Because that's a pretty important part of your scholarship of teaching and learning. And if you can get past that level of sharing it with your students, who's next? Who's next on your to-share list? I wish you all the best. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until then, happy reflecting.